postdoc in the ecology and evolutionary biology department here at Princeton, and she's going to talk to us about diseases and travel. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, yep. So today I'm going to talk about some of the research that I've been working on, looking at uh, using new types of data sources uh, for disease ecology. And so very broadly, uh, since uh, we're not in the EB department, so you know, disease. disease outbreak. Um, but sort of thinking about the human population has been less studied, uh, partially due to a lack of data availability. And so that's the part that I'm really interested in thinking about, is how can we better understand human population dynamics that can better inform our disease models. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work looking at quantifying human travel patterns. related to spatial disease ecology is we think about it where say you have these two different populations, one's orange and one's blue, and then we're looking at sort of the cases over time. And we see some outbreak of this disease in the orange location and say the disease was never found in the blue location. Um, but then over time we see an outbreak there. What we often infer is that somehow there was some introduction event. So somehow the disease went from this orange location to the blue location. Um, and for certain pathogens, that's normally only mediated by humans. So if there's no zoonotic, so if there's not like a way you can get it from a chicken or like a cow or something, uh, and it's just people to people transmission, or people are the ones that move it really far, then we'd infer that some of the people who were in that location had moved to this other one, introduced the disease, and then we see an outbreak. Uh, and this is particularly important if we're trying to think about public health interventions. So normally, there's a very limited amount of time and money and people to do any type of intervention. So if there's a way we can see how different dynamics in different places are coupled, perhaps we can, instead of trying to vaccinate everyone in both locations, if we do it early enough, we might be able to only vaccinate the people in the orange location. Um, and this has been in the news a lot. So this is a New York Times article that looks about um, somebody who came from um, Liberia and imported Ebola into Dallas. <laughs> so we see that people are traveling very large distances who may be infected and in introducing the disease uh, much further away, um, but also about travel and restricting travel. So a lot of the issues about pregnant women traveling to Zika-infected countries and should they or should they not be traveling. Um, or also just specific strains of the disease being imported places. So there's a super gonorrhea, which is terrifying, because it's super. Um, that's, that's like pretty much very little treatment. So there's a lot of concern about people who are infected with this going to other places and transmitting it there. Um, but this is not a new problem. So this is a map that shows the spread of the plague in the 1300s uh, that started in Asia and then spread throughout Europe and Africa. Um, and for example, like this one particular route took about like 15 years to go from Burma up to China. Um, so this has been happening for a very long amount of time. Um, and this is just another example. So uh, this is a paper that was written in 2004 that looks at um, travel between India and Fiji. And so before there were steam engines, it took about three months to get between um, India to Fiji. Um, and then afterwards, once they had uh, this new type of ship, they were able to get there in one month. And they were actually able to relate this to uh, disease outbreaks of measles. So measles is a ch predominantly childhood infectious disease. It's vaccine preventable, but it's very, very infectious. So pretty much if you're around someone who has measles, you haven't been vaccinated, you're going to get measles. Um, and so here they have sort of the length of the voyage in days and the number of immigrants who are taking each of those types of vessels. And we have steamships over here and sailing ships over here. Um, and then this top part is about the generation time. So one generation time, so if I have measles, I don't have measles, and then I give it to you, that's like one generation of how when you're able to travel these distances much in a much shorter amount of time, even though both on sailing ships and steamships, people were leaving who had measles, shown in these um, colored, uh, these gray areas, 
Uh, what happens when you're able to travel much further is you're able to introduce the disease into Fiji. So here, um, if it's a circle that's colored in, uh, that shows that the measles was actually able to arrive uh, where you landed. So people got in India, some of those people were infected, but when it took a really long time to get Fiji, it sort of wasn't able to persist on the ship long enough to introduce it to Fiji too. But as soon as you're able to travel in a much faster amount of time, uh, you're able to introduce the disease. So this is from a very long time ago. Um, but even more and more, uh, human travel is increasing and people are having a lot more global connectivity. So this is also from that paper where one of the authors uh, talked, to his, talked to his parents and grandparents. And so this is his great grandfather and sort of where his grandfather had traveled from like his small town in England to like the neighboring small town in England. And he hadn't even gone as far as like the like slightly larger small town in England. Uh, then his grandfather had sort of traveled around the area a little bit more, even going to places like London. Uh, his father had fought in World War II, so traveled around Europe a lot. Uh, but he was a malariologist, so he studied malaria and had traveled around the world. So even just in these few generations, you can see how global connectivity is greatly increasing, how diseases can be spreading, and how people can be moving at much faster speeds. Um, but so what I'm really interested in is how can we actually quantify this, uh, and how can we do this particularly in low-income settings? So places like the US might have a census or commuting to work type survey that we could use to infer how many people are traveling between different airports or something. Uh, but that's much less common in other parts of the world. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually do this. So lots of people have done studies throughout history looking at uh, the how people were traveling and how that might be related to diseases. So this is a WHO report from the 60s where um, this malariaologist had gone around and talked to people and tried to figure out sort of what parts of the country people were moving between and when it was happening seasonally. And so this type of information is really useful if we're trying to think about control strategies, but it's very difficult because it's not really quantified. We don't really know how many people were traveling, uh, how frequently they were traveling, and how does this relate to current day. Um, although we are able to get sort of a broad picture of types of movements and things, when we're trying to model the disease dynamics, we really want something much finer. And so there are lots of different ways you can do this um, uh, on different types of spatial scales, so neighborhoods up to international travel, and over uh, lots of different time points. So these are just some of the more traditional uses of these data. So for neighborhoods, people often will put a GPS logger on someone, and then you're able to collect that data and see where they're going, you know, where they go to school, where they go to work, where they go to the market. Uh, for if you have a very specific type of travel you want to get at, people often use travel surveys. So you'll go out into a place and ask people, you know, in the last two months, uh, have you gone to this place or not? Um, for international travel, people use flight patterns and flight data that will say how many people were on planes between different airports. Or the most uh, traditional and collected widely is census data. Uh, but there's sort of issues with each of these when we try to incorporate them and relate them to disease dynamics. So with GPS data, often you're limited in how many people you can enroll. And the GPSs that are traditionally used die every two weeks or so. So then you have to go and like go back out and give them a new logger. Uh, flight patterns are likely only a small percentage of all the travel that you're trying to incorporate. So it might be good if you want to look at the risk of Ebola coming to the US, but that's not necessarily going to give you a good picture of how Ebola might be spreading in Liberia. The census is only collected every five years, and a number of countries don't collect them regularly. Uh, and travel surveys, although you're able to get a very specific question asked, it's difficult to see how representative they are uh, if you're trying to look more generally. Um, and ideally what we'd like to do is we'd like to take sort of this general idea where we want to capture these epidemiologically relevant types of travel, uh, but be able to do it where we can say things about individuals, say how long they're going places, where they're going from and to, and how frequently that's occurring. Um, and so there's been a lot of promise in like new types of data and how uh, all we need now is like these new amazing data sets and then we're going to like tap them and then we're going to know everything and then no one's going to die from any disease. Uh, this is like a good idea in theory, but part of the issue is I think there's this notion 
uh, that there's this data that exists somewhere, something, and all we have to do is figure out like how we extract said data, and then we're gonna like use it for our brilliant idea we have, and then we're gonna like be concerned about some sort of disease, we're gonna figure out who to vaccinate, and then we don't have the disease anymore. Uh, so I think uh, this like cell is, is how we do it, talk to mobile phone operators, but I think in reality it's a little bit more complicated. Um, because in particular, even if you have a gigantic data source that's just bigger than other people's data, unless you have like a specific question and if the way you're going to analyze it, it's very difficult to find utility in these data. Um, and so lots of our research has been looking at using mobile phone data, how we can actually extract human mobility patterns, and how we can relate that directly to disease dynamics. Um, and so to utilize these data, um, we uh, have to sort of coordinate between a lot of people in both academia, industry, government, and public health. And particularly if our ultimate goal is try to inform public health policy or uh, public health training in different countries, we really have to figure out how to uh, work across all these different uh, areas uh, to be able to make sure that the data that's being extracted, everyone knows what it's going to be used for, who's going to use it, and exactly how it's going to be utilized. And also on the public health side of, you know, who is actually going to figure out where they're targeting different interventions, understand the biases that were in these data and sort of the assumptions we made. Uh, so we work, so I work a lot with mobile phone operators across the world. Um, and these are just some of the people that are in the mobile phone operators that you need to sort of get on board. So you need the people, the privacy people, to say that, like, this is all above board. It's fine. You're allowed to do this. You need um, the business people to say that there might be some way that you could possibly um, have some utility for the company. Uh, you need the people who are actually able to do it. And then you also need the public relations people. So when the results come out, they don't say, like, you are, like, tapping everyone's phone and now everyone's going to die. Um, you also need like ac people in academia to actually do all the work. Uh, and you need the telecom regulators on board. Uh, so depending on the country, it, dep it varies what kind of data be can be used for what purposes. So we tend to work with government, uh, government regulators in the beginning, and we uh, highly aggregate and anonymize the data to make sure that it is OK for the regulators. And then you also need some people in public health who you're the ones that are collaborating with, who actually know the disease you're studying about a lot, and are able to implement any suggestions you have. Um, and so in particular, all these different groups are really interested in what is the public health application, um, who's, what will the data be used, and who's going to analyze it, and exactly how is it going to be analyzed, aggregated, and anonymized. And so normally, when we start a project, we have to have a very clear, specific question. We want to understand how to optimize malaria vaccination, uh, measles vaccination in Pakistan. Um, and then we're able to get all these different people on board once they agree sort of what uh, scale the data that we're going to be analyzing and what it's going to be used for. Um, so what we use is these mobile phone call data records. And so the idea is that if you have some country and you have the locations of all the mobile phone towers in that country, each individual subscriber, they create these call data records. Um, and so every single person will be anonymized with an ID, and then we know the locations of the towers and where they're uh, making calls or sending texts and when that's occurring. And these sort of show up in these, uh, so most mobile phone operators will store these. These are some call data records that are from Norway. Uh, where you have the A number of who's calling, who they're calling for the B number, where it's taking place, what kind of traffic it is, um, and when it is occurring. And what we do is we utilize these data to infer human travel patterns. So what we do is, so we have an idea of the locations of all the towers, we have an individual subscriber's call data records, um, and then suppose this person had made a call at tower B, that's purple, and then at tower C later in the day, that's orange. Um, and then say they made another call at tower C. What we do is for each individual subscriber, we infer their most used tower on that given day. Uh, so this person, because they made two calls at C, we'd say the tower they used the most was C, and that C was in this broader location that's orange. Um, and this orange location could be something like a village or a settlement or a district. 
Uh, then say the next day, the person goes and makes a call uh, at tower A, and they make another one. Then we'd say on day two, that person was most at tower A, uh, and tower A is in this green area. And so then we'd infer that this subscriber between day one and day two went between orange and green. So the reason we aggregate up the data in this way is partially to uh, <coughs> to anonymize the data further. So we're not keeping every individual's individual like GPS type data. This is much more aggregated. And we're trying to see sort of broad patterns of mobility uh, within a country. Uh, and what we would do is we would do this uh, for every subscriber over all the days. And then we'd have an idea of the trips that were taken. So this person, we'd say, between day one and day two, they went from orange to green. Between day two and day three, they went to green to purple, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we do this for every subscriber in the database often. So it's normally something in the order of millions of individual subscribers that we're doing. And then we're able to aggregate up all of these trips to say broadly, on a given day, how many people are going between different parts of the country based on the mobile phone subscribers. Um, so mobile phone data is not perfect, and there's lots of different biases that are in these data. So for example, they're not necessarily a randomized sample of the population. You know, the census data might be only every five years, but it's powered in such a way that it should be representative. We know that these data are not representative. They're, in general, skewed towards uh, more urban educated males, particularly in many low-income settings, although that's changing over time. And in addition, the tower density affects our ability to measure different kinds of movements. So if there are no mobile phone towers there, we would not say anybody's traveling there, even though people may be. Uh, it is true that tower density tends to correlate with population density, so we tend to measure where more people are, but it does hinder our ability to say things about, about certain areas of the country. Um, but nonetheless, we've still been doing this in lots of different countries for lots of different diseases, using a bunch of different uh, collaborations in, across public health, academia, and um, mobile phone operators. And so some of the basic things that we've been doing is trying to look at what are the biases in these data, um, how do they compare to other sources of data like the census, um, how we can model these data, uh, and sort of how do they vary seasonally and things. And so these are some of the general things we've been trying to look at. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about two specific disease examples. Um, so the first is about disease elimination and control for malaria. Um, so <coughs> this is a documentary f that was made by Disney uh, that was about malaria and uh, to kill the mosquito. The, uh, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs are in this movie. It's a little, it's a little strange. <laughs> they like spray insecticide. If you ever want to watch it and you have 12 minutes to spare, it's on YouTube. Uh, so malaria is a mosquito-borne infectious disease that's caused by this particular parasite. Um, and the life cycle involves a combination of humans, the parasite, and the mosquito. So a person can't give malaria to another person. Uh, a mosquito can bite an infected person, it incubates in the mosquito, then that mosquito can bite somebody and infect them. It's an estimated that there are over 200 million cases of malaria uh, with about half a million deaths. deaths. Uh, and in particular, in malaria, you can be asymptomatically infected. So that means you can have the parasites in your blood, but you might not have any clinical symptoms. Uh, malaria is predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, as this map shows. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the, the map of malaria has changed greatly in the last uh, in a number of decades. So this is the map of uh, malaria. So any country that's in green did not have malaria, and all the countries in pink had malaria in the 1970s. Compare that to 2015, and the map has shrunk a lot more. So there's an, a number of countries who have uh, eliminated malaria, had been malaria free for a while, or in the process of eliminating or in controlling malaria. And sort of as the map sh shrinks a lot, we have to think closer about sort of the spatial dynamics and the relationship between the vector, the humans, and the parasites. So there's a lot of different ways we can, tr can, can control malaria. You can spray insecticides to kill the vector. You can have people sleep under bed nets so they're not bit. They're working on a number of malaria vaccines that have various degrees of poor efficacy. Uh, or you can have people access drug treatment to kill the parasite. 
Um, but human travel, the way it's sort of related to this new idea of malaria control and elimination, is through either malaria resurgence or targeted interventions. Uh, so malaria resurgence pretty much just means you have a place and you've been controlling malaria really well, and there's no transmission in that place, so people are not getting infected there. What can happen, though, is if you have enough people who are importing the parasite. So because you can be asymptomatic, so you might have the parasites, you're not sick, you're traveling to a place, they still have a lot of mosquitoes, you're actually able to introduce the parasite back in. Uh, so this has happened a number of times <coughs> at vari in various continents and countries. The other way that malaria control, uh, human travel can impact malaria control is through targeted interventions. Um, so suppose you have your village here and your people in your village, and some of the people work in a forest or they camp in the forest or they migrate. And in red are these transmission hotspots. So people might not be getting infected in the village. They might go to a forest and get infected and then come back to the village. Uh, so if you just looked at the surveillance case data, you might think that you should do your vector control here because this is where your people live. They go to a health facility there. You see all the malaria cases there. Uh, but because people are traveling to these other transmission hotspots, you should actually be targeting your vector control there as opposed to here. And so an understanding of sort of where people are moving and how they might be moving parasites around can help us better identify where we should do targeted control. So the way we incorporate it is we have sort of our movement and connectivity inferred from the mobile phone data. And we're looking at the risk of malaria in different places and people moving between these high risk and low risk places. So in this, if people move from a high risk place to a low risk place, you're concerned that they might be able to introduce the parasites there. Or if you have people going from a low risk to a high risk malaria place, they might be able to reintroduce the parasites or become ill and experience severe clinical symptoms. Um, and this is going to be really important for countries to be able to eliminate. Uh, so the WHO recommends that this importation rate, so the risk that malaria might come back from people traveling, is one of the key metrics to determine if a country is feasible to eliminate. But it's been very difficult to obtain these estimates, uh, mostly because you need a lot of very detailed data about travel. You need to know how long people go, where they came from, where they go to, how frequently they're doing all of these things. Um, and so what we wanted to know is sort of where are the people moving and then where are the parasites moving. And so we did this study in, in Kenya. So this is the, um, the parasite rate prevalence in, uh, for malaria in Kenya, where sort of places that are in red, it's high, and places that are in yellow, it's much lower. And so there's sort of two clear like transmission hotspots within the country along the coast and Lake Victoria. Um, and so what we did is we built a mathematical model that's look at sort of the relationship and the movement of people uh, between these areas. So we measured the trips using the mobile phone data and looking at sort of based on the risk in different places, how many people were moving, who could be reintroducing the parasites or reintroducing or having clinical cases. Um, and so the data we analyzed uh, for this uh, was from provided by Safaricom. Uh, there's about 12,000 mobile phone towers. The data was for a year. There's about 15 million subscribers. And they sent or received about 12 billion calls and SMS. So uh, this is slightly before smartphones were a thing in Kenya. And so this is like the bare bones, like Nokia smart, like phone with a flashlight kind of data. Um, and at the time, the mobile phone operator had the uh, market share of 90, had 92% of the market share. Um, and the main thing that we were able to identify are these sources and sinks of travel and parasite importation. So based on <coughs> uh, travel or the combination of travel with our mathematical model, we're able to identify places that are large sources, meaning they emit a large amount of travel or a large amount of parasites. And sinks are just where those places tend to be going. So here's some of the results looking at travel on the left and parasites on the right. And sources are shown in red and sinks are shown in blue. So for travel, you see there's a lot of sources next to sinks. A lot of people will go to the suburbs and then back and whatnot. Whereas the parasites, there's a very clear source around Lake Victoria and sinks in sort of the Highlands region and around Nairobi. And so this map was made with a combination of these travel data uh, and the mathematical model about parasites moving. 
Um, and so that's good. We're able to show like, oh, look, there are these clear sources. Uh, if you targeted these, there might be spillover effects in the rest of the country. Uh, and that's a very good like academic type exercise. But ultimately, we want to see if they can be used for public health planning. Um, and so to do that, we were working with the CDC in Kisumu that's trying to look at different types of targeted interventions. So uh, the CDC in Kisumu wanted to uh, treat everybody in a certain area and try to identify if there's an effect on malaria in the rest of the country. And normally this is really difficult because it's hard to pinpoint where those effects might be. And you can't necessarily set up really detailed surveillance everywhere. So what we did is we uh, took those initial results and just focused on that particular area that they were looking at and tried to identify which broad parts of the country they should target for surveillance and which finer places within Nairobi they should look at. Uh, we're also working on trying to look at the spread of drug resistance using the same idea across Southeast Asia. Um, and in particular, try to look at <coughs> how people are moving and if they might be infected with a particular version of the disease that is resistant to the frontline treatment. And so for this, we're doing a combination of epidemiological studies, travel surveys, and mobile phone data to try to see how these different types of data sources can all work together to look at um, the spread of drug resistance. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about predicting disease outbreaks for dengue. And so it's still all mobile phone data. It's just a slightly different question where we're trying to look at <coughs> about a, a very specific outbreak in a country. So uh, dengue is a mosquito-borne infectious disease that's called by, caused by the dengue virus. Uh, similar to malaria, it's a combination of, you know, a person who's infected, it gets bit by a mosquito, that mosquito can bite someone else. There are a very large number of cases, about three 190 million cases per year, uh, but the majority of those cases are not severe symptoms and uh, less than a million cases are dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, so for dengue, unlike malaria, there's really no uh, vaccine or treatment. There's no drug you can give someone if they get dengue. Uh, so trying to figure out how to be prepared for it in terms of preparing hospitals and healthcare workers is one of the most important things you can do about dengue. And in many parts of the world, it's emerging. So uh, this is a map of where dengue had been reporting in the 1950s, and this is currently. So there's dengue predominantly in Southeast Asia, but it's definitely becoming a bigger issue in many parts of the world. Um, the majority of dengue is in Southeast Asia or South America, <coughs> but there have been outbreaks in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. Um, and dengue, like many of the other arboviruses, are sort of experiencing a lot of these outbreaks that are mediated by human travel. So lots of people are getting infected and then going to other places where they're able to introduce the pathogen. So we worked on dengue in Pakistan. Uh, so this is a map of Pakistan. And uh, we looked at data, reported cases data from 2013. Um, and Pakistan, uh, so Karachi is the major city in the south of the country. And Karachi has had dengue outbreaks for decades. Um, their first dengue outbreak that was recorded was in 1994. But more recently, they've seen very large outbreaks with like 200,000 cases or more in other parts of the country. So they think what happens is, so dengue has been endemic in Karachi for many decades, uh, but the tire trade is how they've been able to move the vector so the mosquito vector, because you it, it can dry out, and then you can rehydrate it, and then it can still be alive. And so they think that the mosquito lives in the tire, the wells of tires that get imported in, and then they move the tires up to sell them. And so now, across the country, there's that vector. And so now, what's happening is that people are traveling between different parts of the country and reintroducing the virus. And so the outbreak we looked at lasted for about seven months, and it starts much earlier in Karachi, uh, and then it moves up across the country effectively. And in particular, this is the first outbreak that they'd ever report, recorded in Swat Valley. Um, and so what had, pe so previously, to try to understand sort of where is dengue going to emerge and where uh, can it emerge, uh, has been mostly based on temperature. So because most of Pakistan had not experienced dengue outbreaks, uh, most of the country does not have like a dengue preparedness type um, program. And so we wanted to see if we could figure out a way to refine this sort of measure. Uh, and so what we did is we modeled the susceptible population and environmental suitability for the mosquito vector. 
uh, looked at the chance that the virus, could be, virus was going to be introduced by human travel and then try to look at the outbreak uh, based on the case data. And so we know that based on laboratory studies that there is an effect of temperature on the mosquito population. So parts of Pakistan get both too hot and too cold to have year-round transmission. So it gets really, really hot and the mosquitoes can't lay as many eggs. Uh, so that's likely interrupting transmission. So it's likely that the outbreaks not in Karachi are being caused by humans in Kar uh, around Karachi being infected and moving around the country. Um, so we built this dengue model that looks at um, the human population, the mosquitoes, uh, that is sort of a traditional R S E I R type model, where we model sort of the interactions between all of these things uh, and fit them to the case data. And so we worked with a mobile phone operator in Pakistan, Telnor, uh, who, uh, and this is the coverage. So any place that's in gray, there's a mobile phone tower there. And there's about 40 million subscribers in the data. And in particular, there's, there's a major highway that goes up through the country. And there was a very large amount of travel up that highway that we were able to observe from the mobile phone data. Um, and so what we did is we have our mosquito model. And we're trying to look at the outbreaks in different parts of the country. <coughs> so if we have this orange place. And from our model, we're able to look at the case data and infer when the, when the disease was likely introduced. Um, and then if we have an idea about another location that had an earlier outbreak, we can see how these uh, introductions may have been occurring and how do they sort of time up with when we predict the outbreak started. Um, and in particular, we compared this against a diffusion type model, which just is sort of assumes that like, there's like some spatial diffusion type kernel of travel patterns. Uh, so Pakistan does not collect any type of mobility data regularly. In particular, they don't collect any data that goes between many of the provinces. Um, so sort of this spatial kernel type diffusion model is, was our null model. And in comparison to this diffusion model that just sort of assumes that there's going to be a decay with distance for the amount of trips, we see that there's a very large amount of trips quite far distances in Pakistan, likely because it's connecting those very uh, large economic hubs. And so what we did is we have our case data. And using the mobile phone data, we sort of predicted when introductions were likely occurring. So we modeled the outbreak in the southern part of the country. And then we're looking at the disease dynamics there, how many people are traveling from that area, and where they're going. So with the mobile phone data, we predict a lot of, out, uh, a lot of introductions early in the Punjab area of the country. With that diffusion model, we just sort of think that the disease should be diffusing outwards, and there should be a lot of outbreaks in the southern part of the country. Uh, compared to the actual case data, there are actually very f almost no cases reported in the southern part of the country, with most of the outbreaks concentrated here, which looks much similar, more similar to our mobile phone data. So that like convinced me that like it was worth to keep doing it. Uh, but then we're we're actually able to look really fine scale at very particular tessiles, which are kind of like counties in the U.S of trying to predict sort of how accurate are, are our estimates for very particular places. So this is for Lahore, where uh, the gray area is the suitability for the vector. The disease data, the actual reported disease data is in red. And what we do is we uh, infer when the likely introduction occurred. So just using this data and the suitability and our model, we infer that the likely introductions occurred around here. So that means, based on this outbreak and the susceptible population, the first introduced case probably occurred within this bound that led to this outbreak. Then what we do is we compare it to when our predicted introductions from both this uh, spatial diffusion model or our mobile phone data. And any time there's a square or a dot, that means we'd predict at least one introduction. And so in Lahore, uh, both the diffusion model and the mobile phone data are predicting introductions around that area. In that band, uh, the mobile phone data is a little a few weeks before, but both of them do fairly similar. Uh, this is comparison to SWAT. So this is a place that this is the first outbreak they've ever reported. Uh, and it's the same thing where we have the vector suitability in the back and then in red, the dengue cases. And so we did the same thing where we use the model and the population susceptibility and these cases to try to predict when the introductions occurred. Um, and in particular, the 
diffusion model never predicted any introductions. So SWAT is just like too far and there's like too many other places you could be going between the southern part of the country and there. So they didn't actually predict that any, any disease, any cases would be introduced. Whereas the mobile phone data predicts, although this band is very large, it does overlap with them and predicts some disease, some introductions around that time. So I think this helps emphasize how using um, data that's actually like from people can be useful to try to predict how people are actually moving. Um, and so what we did in the end is try to refine that initial map that looks mostly about climatic variables to try to look at that in combination with importations uh, to look at epidemic risk. So if it's suitable for the vector at that time of the year, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and you have introductions from other parts of the country that have ongoing outbreaks, then we'd say that your risk is high. Um, and so we did this uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health uh, to try to refine these estimates about risk. And in particular, we've been working with them to try to look at disease risk mapping tools. So is there a way that we can directly work with the mobile phone operator to process the data? Since so, so when we did this project, we all flew to Pakistan and we sat in the mobile phone offices and processed the data and like set up how the pro data gets processed on their servers. Uh, and so their servers can process it and everything. And so is there a way that the data could be sort of processed in the company in real time, go to the Ministry of Health into these kinds of disease risk mapping tools that looks at where the case is being reported now, can we update where they might be getting imported to? Um, so some conclusions. So uh, human travel sort of impacts disease dynamics by introducing the pathogen into susceptible populations. Uh, I talked mostly about mosquito-borne diseases, but this is true for lots of other ones too. And sort of an understanding of actual human travel patterns and behavior can be used on fine and coarse spatial and temporal scales to inform our disease models and inform our disease prediction. And ultimately, the hope is that these can all be used for public health uh, planning and policy. Um, so there's a lot of people who I work with on this stuff, particularly people at Princeton and EEB. Um, and there's a very large number of funders. Um, thanks. Yes.